Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Spark Summit 2017. Brought to you by Databricks. Welcome back to theCUBE. We're talking about data science and engineering at scale, and we're having a great time, aren't we, George? We are. Well, we have another guest now we're going to talk to. I'm very uh, pleased to introduce Matt Hunt, who's a technologist at Bloomberg. Matt, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. All right, well, we're going to talk about a lot of exciting stuff here today, but I want to first start with, you're a long time member of the Spark community, right? How, how many Spark summits have you been to? Uh, almost all of them, actually, so. Really? It's pretty amazing to see the 10th one, yes. All right, and you're pretty actively involved with the user group on the East Coast? Uh, yeah, I run the New York uh, users group. All right, well, what's that all about? <laughs> well, you know, we have some 2,000 people in, in New York uh, mm -hmm. who are interested in finding out what, what uh, goes on and how, which technologies did you use and what are people working on. All right, so hopefully you saw the keynote this morning with Mate. Yes. All right, any comments or reactions from the things that he talked about as priorities? Well, you know, I've always loved the keynotes at the Spark Summits because mm -hmm. they announce something that you don't already know is coming in advance, at least for most people. Uh, the mm -hmm. second Spark Summit actually had people gasping in the audience while they were <laughs> demoing with a lot of senior people. It well, was the really one millisecond today was kind of a wow. Exactly, it? and I would say the, the one thing to pick out of the keynote that really stood out for me was the uh, changes and improvements they've made for streaming. Um, mm -hmm. uh, including potentially being able to do sub-millisecond times for some workloads. Okay. Well, maybe talk to us about uh, some of the apps that you're building at Bloomberg, and then I want you to join in, George, and, and drill down on some of the details. Sure, uh, you know, I mean, Bloomberg is a large company with 4,000 plus developers. Uh, we've been working on apps for 30 years, so we actually have a wide range of applications, uh, almost all of which are for news in the financial industry. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of homegrown technology that we've had to adapt over time, starting from when we built our own hardware, uh, but there are some significant things that um, some of these technologies can potentially really help simplify over time. Uh, some recent ones, I, I, I guess, uh, trade anomaly detection would be one. How can you look mm -hmm. for patterns of uh, insider trading, uh, how can you look for uh, bad trades or attempts to spoof. Uh, there's a huge volume of trade data that comes in, uh, that's a natural application. Uh, another one would be regulatory. There's a regulatory system called MIFID, or mm -hmm. MIFID II, their regulations required for Europe. You have to be able to record every trade for seven, seven years, provide daily reports. Um, uh, there's clearly a lot around that. And then I would also just say, our other internal databases have sufficient, significant analytics uh, that can be done, which is just kind of scraping the surface. Mm -hmm. These applications sound like they're um, oriented towards streaming solutions and, uh, and really low latency. Has that been a, a constraint on what you can build so far? Um, I would definitely say that we have some things that are latency constrained. It tends to be uh, not like high frequency trading where you care about microseconds, but milliseconds are important. How long does it take to get an answer? Um, but um, I would say equally important with latency is efficiency. And those two often wind up being coupled together, though not always. And so when you say coupled, is it because it's a trade-off? or because you need both. Right, so it's, it's a little bit of both. There's an, for a number of things, there's an upper threshold for the latency that we can accept. Um, certain architectural changes imply higher latencies, but often greater efficiencies. Micro-batching often means that you can simplify and get greater throughput. Um, but at a cost of higher latency. On the other hand, if you have a really large volume of things coming in, and you, what your, your method of processing them isn't efficient enough, it gets too slow simply from that, and that's why it's not just one or the other. So in, mm -hmm. in getting down to one millisecond or below, um, can they expose knobs where you can choose the trade-offs between efficiency and latency, and, and you know, is that relevant for the apps that you're building? Uh, I mean, clearly if you can choose between micro-batching and not micro-batching, that's a knob that you can have, so that's one explicit one. Um, but part of what's useful is, often when you, when you set down to try and determine what is the main cause of latency, you have to look at the full profile of a stack of what it's going through, and then you, you discover other inefficiencies that can be ironed out. 
Uh, and so it just makes it faster overall. And I would say a lot of what uh, the Databricks guys and the Spark community have worked on over the years is connected to that. Project Tungsten and so on. Well, there are the, all these things that make things much slower, much less efficient than they need to be, and we can close that gap a lot. I would say that's you know, from, from the very beginning. This brings up something that we were talking about earlier, which is um, Matei has talked for a long time about wanting to take end-to-end -end control of continuous apps for simplicity and performance. Um, and so that, you know, there's this, we'll write with transactional consistency, so we're assuring, assuring the customer of, you know, exactly one semantics when we write to a file system or a database or something like that. But Spark has never really done native storage, um, whereas he, uh, Matei came here on, on the show earlier today and said, well, Databricks as a company is going to have to do something in that area, and he talks specifically about databases, and um, and he said he he implied that Apache Spark, separate from Databricks, would also have to do more in state management. I don't know if he was saying you know key value store, but um, how would that how would that open up? you know, a broader class of apps. How would it make your life simpler as a developer? Right, uh, interesting and uh, great, great question. This is kind of a subject that's near and dear to uh, my own heart, I, I, I would say. Um, so part of that, you know, taking a step back, is about some of what's, some of the potential promise of what Spark could be or what they've always wanted to be, which is a form of a universal computation engine. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a lot of value if you can learn one small skill set, but it can, it can work in a wide variety of use cases, whether it's streaming or at rest or analytics mm -hmm. and, and, and plug other things in. Um, as always, there's a gap in any such system between theory and reality and how much can you close that gap. But as for storage systems, you know, I mean, this is something that, um, I mean, you and I have talked about this before and, and, and I've written about a, 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 a fair amount too. Um, Spark is historically an analytics system, right? So you have a bunch of data and you can do analytics on it. But where does that data come from? Well, either it's streaming in or you're reading from files, but most people need essentially an actual database. So what constitutes the universal system? You need file store, you need a distributed file store. Uh, you need a database with um, generally transactional semantics because the other forms are too hard for people to understand. Um, uh, you need uh, analytics that are extensible and you need a way to stream data in. Um, and there's, you know, how close can you get to that versus how much do you have to fit other parts that come together? Very interesting question. So, um, so far they've sort of outsourced that to, you know, D DIY, do it yourself. Um, but if they can find a, a sufficiently scalable um, relational database, they can do the sort of analytical queries and they can sort of maintain state, you know, with, with transactions for some amount of the data flowing through. My impression is that, like, Cassandra would be the, sort of the database, you know, that would handle all, all updates and then some amount of those would be filtered through to a, a sort of a multi-model DBMS. I, when I say multi-model, I mean um, handles transactions and analytics. Um, knowing that you could, you would have the option to drop that out. What app, what app applications would you undertake that you that you couldn't use right now? Where, you know, the theme was we're going to take big data apps into production, and then the competition that they show, like for streaming, is um, Kafka and Flink. So what does that do to that competitive balance? Right, so um, how many pieces do you need and how well do they fit together is maybe the, the essence of that question. Yeah. And people ask that all the time. And one of the limits has been how mature is each piece, how efficient is it, um, and do they work together? Um, and you know, if, you have to, if you have to master 5,000 skills and 200 different products, um, that's a huge impediment to real world usage. Um, I think we're coalescing around a smaller set of options. Um, so in the, um, 
Kafka, for example, has a lot of usage and it seems to really be, the industry seems to be settling on that is the, you know, what people are using for inbound streaming data mm -hmm. um, as for, for ingest. I, I see that everywhere I go. Um, mm -hmm. But what happens when you move from Kafka into Spark, or Spark has to read from a database? Mm -hmm. um, this is a partly a question of maturity. Relational databases are very hard to get right. The ones that we have have been under development for decades, right? I mean, DB2 has been around for a really long time with very, very smart people working on it, or Oracle. Uh, or lots of other databases. So at Bloomberg, you know, we actually developed our own databases for relational databases that were uh, designed for low latency and very high reliability. Mm -hmm. So we actually just open sourced uh, that a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, it's called Condi 2 And the reason we had to do that was the industry solutions at the time when we started working on that were inadequate to our needs. Mm -hmm. um, but we look at how long that took to develop or these other systems and think, that's really hard for someone else to get right. And so, um, if you need a database, um, which everyone does, how can you make that work better with Spark? And I think there are a number of very interesting developments that can make that a lot better, short of Spark becoming and integrating a database directly, although there's, there's interesting uh, possibilities with that too, right? How do you make them work well together? We could talk about for a while because that's a fascinating question. On uh, mm -hmm. on that one one topic, mm -hmm. maybe the Databricks guys don't want to assume responsibility for the development because then they're picking a winner, perhaps. Maybe the, as Matei told us earlier, they can make the APIs easier to use for a database vendor to integrate. But like we've seen, Slice Machine and and Snappy Data do the work take it upon themselves to take data frames, the core data structure um, in, uh, in uh, Spark, and give it transactional semantics. Um, does that sound promising? I, there are multiple avenues for potential success, um, and who can use which in a way depends on the audience. Um, if you look at things like Cassandra and HBase, they're distributed key value stores that um, uh, you know, additional things are being built on. Uh, so they started as distributed and they're moving towards uh, more encompassing systems versus relational databases, which generally started as single image on single machine and are moving towards federation distribution. And there's been a lot with that with Postgres, for example. Um, I, you know, why, one of the questions would be, uh, is it just knobs or why don't they work well together? Uh, and there, there are a number of reasons. Uh, one is, what can be pushed down? Uh, how much knowledge do you have to have to make that decision? And optimizing that, I think, is actually one of the really interesting things that could be done. Just as we have database query optimizers, mm -hmm. why not, you know, can you determine the best way to execute down a chain? In order to do that well, there are two things that you need uh, that, that haven't yet been widely adopted but are coming. One is the very efficient copy of data between systems. And Apache Arrow, for example, um, is very, very interesting. Uh, and it's nearing the time when I think it's just going to explode because it lets you connect these systems radically more efficiently in a standardized way. And that's one of the things that was missing. As soon as you hop from one system to another, all of a sudden you have this immense computational expense. That's a problem, we can fix that. The other is uh, the next level of integration requires uh, basically exposing more hooks. Uh, in order to know where should a query be executed and which operator should I push down, you need uh, something that I think of as a meta-optimizer and also knowledge about the shape of the data or statistics underlying and ways to exchange that back and forth um, to be able to do it well. Wow, Matt, a lot of great questions there. We're coming up on a break, so uh, we have to wrap things up, but I want to give you at least 30 seconds to maybe sum up what you'd like to see uh, your user community, the Spark community, do over the next year. What, sure. what are the top issues, things you'd love to see worked on? Right. Um, you know, it, the, it's an exciting time for Spark because, uh, you know, as time goes by, it gets more and more mature and more real world applications are viable. The hardest thing of all is to get, is to anywhere you go in any organization is to get people working together. Um, but the more people work together to make, to enable these pieces, how do I efficiently work with databases or have these better optimizations, uh, make streaming more mature, 
the more people can use it in practice, um, and that's why people develop software, is to actually tackle these real world problems. So mm -hmm. uh, I would love to see more of that. Can we all get along? Can't we all? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to be the last word of this segment. Matt, Matt, thank you so much for coming and spending some time with us here to uh, share the story. My pleasure. All thank right, you. thank you so Thanks. much. Thank you. thank you, George. And thank you all for watching this segment of theCUBE. Please stay with us at Spark Summit 2017. We'll be back in a few moments. <laughs>